For Kruma Media's Quality, I'm Sane Zamini. Joining me today is Nikolaus Kekines, the author of the best-selling book, The Case of Dekomodise, to discuss his new book titled Ghetto Ninja, The Story of Junior Kanye. Nikolaus, the book relates the story of Junior Kanye, who used to play for Kaiser Chiefs uh, Football Club. Can you give us some insight into his life uh, growing up in Davidson? And tell us a bit about his love for karate before he discovered football. Yeah, so you know, Davidson's a really interesting place in South Africa. It's one of these places that just, you can see when, you, when you're there, there's a lot of fire in the people there. Um, mm. The people there are very expressive. You know, you even heard some people describe it as the Brazil of South Africa when it comes to talent and these kind of things. Yeah. Um, but it's also a rough place to grow up. You know, it's, it's not necessarily a safe place. Even the people who grew up there, you know, have encountered danger from time to time. Mm. And uh, when Junior was growing up in Davidson, it was a particularly poor place. Mm. It was just at the end of apartheid. And there was really very little opportunity around for any of the adults. And many of the kids weren't even in school. One thing Junior would do to keep busy during the day was he, he joined... Um, we did a few things. And one of the things was he joined like a Pansula dancing troupe. But another thing he did was, you know, when, when they used to be looked after by, by the local community Gogo there, um, she used to put on SABC for them. And SABC back in the day used to play Kung Fu movies a lot. They used to often play these like karate movies. So to many of the kids who grew up in Davidson in the 80s, Bruce Lee is like a township hero to these kids. And Junior and his friends would often go out and try um, imitate the moves that Bruce Lee did. They would practice the backflips, practice the karate chops and the whole thing. You know, there was something special about Bruce Lee. He defeated his opponents with athleticism and attitude. And that's mm-hmm. what the Davidson boys wanted to do. They wanted to be like that. And they translated that style and that, that attitude, they translated it to the football field. And can you briefly tell us how he got the name Ninja? Him and the other boys would go around practicing the, these Kung Fu moves. And then one day a local scout was driving around and he was selecting young boys for his team, um, just a local team in Davidson. And he saw Junior doing a somersault and he said, no, okay, this kid's athletic. And he said, come, come play for my team. And Junior said, no, I don't, I'm not interested in soccer. I don't want to play soccer. And then this guy looked at him. He said, oh, okay, you think you're some kind of ghetto ninja? And he called him that. And the name just stuck. He actually made Junior play goalkeeper first then because of that. Because Junior said, no, I can't play football. So he said, okay, that's fine. You stand in between the sticks and you like karate chop the ball away with your hands. That's how you can play. So he started playing as goalkeeper. And the first guy who ever scouted him called him a ghetto ninja, like kind of as an insult, but it became this driving force, this moxie for for Junior. And his parents, especially his father, when I read the book, kept on emphasizing that he he had to get an education despite his love for football. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the offer now that his parents declined from Supersports United in 2002. For Junior's parents, education was very important. And it was for a very simple reason that at the time Junior's father was, was growing up, and before then, you know, they were part of the first families that helped establish Davidson um, and establish Etwatwa right next to Davidson. You know, before where, where there's Etwatwa now, there was nothing. And when these guys were growing up there, there were also very many talented people there, um, just like Junior. Many talented footballers, many talented singers, many talented runners, many ta- there, was, there was lots of talent. But none of those people ever got an opportunity largely because of the apartheid system. Junior's father had been in this place where he had seen that you can have all the talents in the world, but if the right person doesn't watch you play, you, you would have wasted your whole life. So he said, you know, nothing's guaranteed. Your success is not guaranteed. Get the education first. That's more important because no one can take that away from you. But obviously it's very hard to tell that to a, a young boy who has ambitions of being a footballer. You're not going to get him to sit down in front of science homework when all he can think about is football. He was always in this battle against his parents and and his dad never really wanted him to play football. And Junior later on in life would reflect and think that maybe his dad was right because through Junior's career, a lot of tragedies happened to him. A lot of very deeply tragic moments happened to him and his family. 
from an outsider's perspective, I wouldn't say it had anything to do with football. But for Junior, sometimes I think it does feel like it had something to do with football, that maybe if he had listened to his dad all those years ago, he wouldn't have suffered all the tragedies that he did. After he was brought to Kaiser Chiefs Development, he was fired because of his behavior there. But can you tell us about uh, now Ace Ntwelenge going to fetch him at home back in Davidson? Yeah, so this is another thing about, about Davidson footballers, and at least this is the reputation. For how talented they are, they're equal parts naughty, you know? And they are, they're just these guys who like, and it's a double-edged sword, right? Because the same naughtiness that they have off the field, um, that attitude, that fire, that naughtiness, that, that, that cheekiness, like that is what translates to a beautiful style of football. So mm-hmm. it's because of that, that attitude, that belief that they play such beautiful football, but at the same time, it means they've not disciplined off the field, you know? Mm-hmm. So they, they had these problems with Davidson footballers for a while, you know, obviously a famous example is Jabu Pule, now Jabu Mahyangu. These were guys who just were so brilliant on the field, but they could not be controlled off the field. And they knew how brilliant they were on the field, so they, they pushed their luck off the field. There's games we all remember watching the, some of these guys play growing up, and yeah. only to find out years later that they were intoxicated while they were playing a game, mm. while they were in the Soweto derby, while they were at the training session, they were intoxicated. And, you know, the whole country's watching them on TV and they play really well still. They're still scoring goals. They're still dribbling players. But obviously, it's not sustainable. Mm. At some point, the outside world catches up with the inside world in football. At some point, your employers, the club that, that hires you, they get tired of having people show up to the training grounds complaining about what this one did at the club last weekend, mm. complaining about how they saw this one driving his car last weekend. And it catches up with them eventually. So you often find teams having to do this thing, like sending Aysen Soleng, arguably our greatest footballer of all time, has to go Mm -hmm. fetch this kid from Davidson, has to go Mm -hmm. speak to his mother, has to ask other kids, where, where, point me to Junior, where can I find him? It's it's a common story you hear often in South African football, where the legends, Mm -hmm. because they understand, they've been from the same place. They also grew up at Kasi. They know the challenges these guys face and they go there and they plead them with tears in their eyes saying, please guys, please behave. I know where this road leads. You you will end up with nothing. Just focus, stay disciplined and you'll have everything. It's very hard to tell someone that when they're 17 years old, they've got more money than they've ever had in their life. They've got more attention than they've ever had in their life. They don't want to listen to advice at that time. Can you briefly highlight to our viewers the benefits of joining such a team when you are growing up? Well, this is the thing is everybody says that they are willing to die to join Mm. a team like that. And at the time they are. But then when they get there, they're no longer willing to die. Mm. Now they're no longer willing to die at all. So that's, that's kind of the issue. And you know what you must understand is that it just takes doing the basics right. If you can be lucky enough to be even scouted by a team like Kaiser Chiefs, Orlando Pirates, Mama Lodi Sundowns, any PSL team, yeah. if all you do is stick to the basics, just be disciplined, show up to training on time, don't cause issues, don't fight with people, don't do crazy things, mm-hmm. you will be a legend and that club will look after you for life. Mm. Long after you retire, that club will look after you. They will find a position for you. They'll find a job for you. You will be employed for the rest of your life if you can just be disciplined. But it's so much easier said than done. Everyone says that they will be disciplined until yeah. they get to that stage, until they feel, you know, like me now, you know, like I've, I've got my things, I've got my car, I've got my money. Mm-hmm. No person who earns less than me is going to tell me anything. And then the discipline goes. So these clubs are incredible things. They're very wealthy. They must be looked at as as some of the wealthiest companies in the country. That's how you must look at them. It's like like getting selected to work for for a bank or one of the top law firms in the country. That's what it's like playing for Kaiser Chiefs or one of these big teams. If you don't take it seriously, it will move on without you and they will forget you ever existed. And you've just uh, highlighted uh, briefly about uh, Jabu Mashangu, uh, formerly known as Jabu Pule. Junior's first debut after joining Kaiser Chiefs was when Jabu Mashangu was nowhere to be found. Tell us about that day. Jabu used to do funny things. Uh, you won't believe 
the stories that, that, that have come out, you know, about Jabu. And, and all credit to him. Jabu mm-hmm. put in a lot of work to reform his life and to get back on the right track. And today, he's a good ambassador to the kids and, and the community. But back then, he was a nightmare. He was an absolute nightmare. And often teams will, will stay in what they call camp before a game where they put the whole team in a hotel and they say, right, everyone, we're having dinner at seven. We're going to bed at eight. Lights yeah. off. You wake up early. We train. After that lights off, that's when problems start. That's when you see Jabu Mashangu climbing out the window, escaping, running. If there's one word that people will associate with Jabu at his time at Chiefs, other than skillful, is mm. AWOL. AWOL is the one word. You, because there was times where Jabu would just go, just go missing for days. No one would hear from him. No one would know where he was. Junior wasn't even expecting to have his debut. The, the reason he had it was because they woke up in the morning and Jabu wasn't there. So they had to go fit Junior. Junior was so sure he wasn't playing. He was also drunk at the time. He had also just come back from party because he thought there's no way they're going to play me today. Against mm. Mamelodi Sundowns, I'm a kid. But they fetched him to replace Jabu. They're funny to look back on now, but they were really heartbreaking at the time because yeah. you must understand when you're a Kaiser Chiefs footballer, you're not just... You're not just an athlete. You are the custodian of the heart of most of the nation. We, we put our faith in you. We, we, we spend our, our wages buying tickets to watch you play. We do backflips when you win. We cry tears when you lose. So Jabu at the time represented so much more than football. He was hope for the nation. And that's why every time he let us down and went out drinking with AWOL, you could hear the nation's heart breaking every time because – this guy was supposed to be our Iniesta. He was supposed to be playing for Barcelona or Manchester United or one of those teams. Junior's fame now landed him in trouble on some occasions, but there's this one incident in the book which involves a, a lady by the name of Nomsa, and he was almost killed there. Can you briefly share that? Yeah, so, so Junior, you know, as he's getting more famous and he's getting this, uh, he, his attitude is, is getting really big, you know, and he's, um, he, when Junior walks into a club, people make him feel like he's a king at this time, you know. Mm-hmm. He'll have gangsters from the area come up to him and say, don't worry, like, we protect you. Everything's mm-hmm. fine. You'll have other people come up and say, there's five girls for you here. Like, the other people come up and say, he has a nice bottle for you. So everyone just throwing him stuff, giving him lots of things. And there's one lady and him started chatting one night. Things, you know, moved on from there. And it turns out this lady had, had actually a very dangerous boyfriend and uh, unknown to Junior at the time. And the next day after after he was in the club, this boyfriend, he, had, he, he was like a gangster and he was friends with a, a policeman that was also a gangster. He was a policeman and a gangster. They came round to Junior's place and they rounded him up. They put him in the car. At first they said, come over here, come speak to us. And he said, no, nah, I'm a star. I'm not coming to you. You want to speak to me? You come here. That's, that's the level of arrogance he had at the time. He wasn't, he's like, I can't just go to some random car if you call me, I'm Junior. Can you? They went and fetched him. They put him in the car. They asked him to explain himself and for like, for a few hours, they drove around Davidson with the full intention of murdering him that day. Mm. And through the time in the car, Junior slowly managed to talk his way out of it, talk his way out of it. There was about four guys in the car. Only the driver was the boyfriend of, of the woman. Junior convinced the three others that he wasn't in the wrong, that she was in the wrong. Mm. And they agreed to side with Junior to the point where the boyfriend left with the car. He left them all there together. And it was just mm-hmm. Junior dealing with the other gangsters and they became friends. And they're still mm-hmm. friends to this day. And now tell us about the last incident. That was the last throw now for Kaiser Chiefs that you mentioned in the, in the book when they fired him. And also talk to us about his struggles now following his departure. Yeah, so, you know, the problem is like when it comes to things like addiction, and, and struggling with discipline, often it's momentum based. So you, you see someone going through so many bad things, you wonder why they can't pull themselves out. But it's like the momentum is carrying them forward, you know. So Junior could get into these phases of life where he just couldn't help but messing up. He was messing up, messing up, messing up. Everything he did was just wrong, 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 wrong. 
And to the point where even Kaiser Chiefs came back and they gave him another opportunity. They said, Junior, you've messed up so many times. But we still believe in you. We still believe in your heart and we believe in your feet and we want you to come back. And he comes back. He misses like three of the four training sessions that week when he's invited back. The one session he goes to, he's so drunk that he throws up next to the coach's feet at, at training. That was eventually where they were like, you know what? You can't be helped, you know? Whatever you get in life, you deserve. And they left him. And it's at that point that most people stopped hearing about Junior Kanyaro. You know, we went through a period of almost a decade where some people even thought he was dead. Junior only came back into the limelight later in life when he became spiritually healed and um, he found purpose and he started a new career as an actor and as a pundit. And the memory of how brilliant he was as a footballer still stuck in everyone's head that they were willing to welcome him back into our hearts as a society. But at that time, that was probably the lowest point of his life, you know. He got kicked out from Kaiser Chiefs then. And Junior has gone from being rich to living in dire poverty about three times in his life, where he's had money and dire poverty. Money, dire poverty. When I say dire poverty, I mean, I mean going two, three days without eating a thing. Mm. Didn't even have a cell phone. He only had a SIM card. He used to yeah. walk around De Cassie with a SIM card, asking people to borrow a phone to put it in to listen to messages. Mm. This is how poor he was. And mm. so after his last mess up, he really, he really felt the consequences. He didn't even have a bank account. Even if someone wanted to pay him money, there'd be no way to pay him. Mm. I was struggling. He was selling old things from Kaiser Chiefs. It doesn't matter how famous you used to be. That's your previous fame has no money value attached to it. It does not translate into cents in your account. And especially in South Africa, it is possible to be very famous one day and be on the street the next day. And can you briefly now tell us if this book has lessons for the young soccer players now who are hoping to make it big one day on the soccer pitch? This book has more than just lessons for the young soccer players I try to write my books in such a way that even if you've never seen a football kicked in your life before, even if you have no interest in football, whatever, you can pick up this book and you won't be lost the whole way. From start to finish, you will be entertained and educated. And there are so many lessons there to learn from young people of all kinds. Whatever you're trying to do in life, if you're trying to be a footballer or you're trying to be an artist or you're trying to be a scientist or you're trying to be a teacher, whatever you're trying to do, the same principles apply. There's ways to mess up your life and there's ways to save your life. And those lessons are within this book. So lastly, this is not uh, the only book that you've written uh, profiling a soccer player. Why do you find their profile so important? The reason is I've been passionate about South African football my whole life. I've Mm -hmm. got a Kaiser Chiefs tattoo on my forearm here. I've never supported Manchester, what, what, Liverpool, what, what. When I was young, my dad said to me, you're born in South Africa. You're not, born yeah. in, you're not born in Chelsea. You weren't born in London, so you support a South African team. And you stick with it through thick and thin. And if yeah, you can yeah. stay loyal to this team, it'll teach you something about life and about mm. supporting something through the highs and the lows. Yes. And growing up a very passionate South African football supporter, we never had books to read. There was no books on South African football. Once mm. they wrote a really boring book on Lucas Radebe and Mark Fish. Uh, but mm-hmm. it was some English guy wrote it, and I tried to read it three times. It's really boring. We didn't have South African writers telling South African <laughs> stories. In the tradition that South Africans like to hear stories now, we have a strong tradition of storytelling in this country. Mm-hmm. Most of our history is passed on orally from generation to generation. Mm-hmm. Now, there are so many fascinating stories in our football. If you were to read just some of the stories in our football, you would think it's like a Hollywood movie. You know, but these stories are only ever known to those that are lucky enough to hear them. So Mm -hmm. unless we start writing them down, they will die with the legends that tell them, unfortunately. So it was very important to me that we started getting books about South African football on on the shelves. And we started getting a young generation of South African kids who have fallen out of love with reading. We start giving them books that excite them, that they can they can be really fired up to wake up and read and finish. That was my goal. That was Nicolaus in conversation with Quality about his book titled Ghetto Ninja, the story of Junior Kanye.